And the last piece of evidence, which is perhaps the most um, interesting and uh, the most um, confirming, is those people who have those experiences of dying, either in an accident or in an operation, floating out of their body and being told it's not their time, coming back again and just actually giving you some insight into actually what happens. The thing is, with um, near-death experiences, as they're called, they are in fact called that for a reason. They're called near-death experiences because it's near death. It's not after death. Death is a process. It takes a, a certain period of time. The brain isn't completely dead until all of the oxygen is gone from the brain and there's no, no um, thought process possible in the brain. That's when we can say that uh, a person's no longer thinking and that they're fully dead. But let's go back to what happens just before you die because that will inform what happens afterwards. Because life is a continuum, it doesn't sort of suddenly change. You know, when you go to bed at night, you wake up pretty much the same person in the morning. Maybe a little bit older, but pretty much the same, at least recognizable. You don't morph into something different. So this is actually what happens even when you die. There's not sort of a sudden morphing into something terribly different. Okay then, so as he says, let's go back to what happens just before the candle flame died. And we'll look very closely at what happened the instant that the candle flame died. And that will inform us as to what happens in the subsequent moments after the candle flame has died. Okay, here is a clip of the moment that the candle flame was snuffed out. And I've slowed down the frame rate so that we can have a close look of what's actually going on. First normal speed, and now slow motion. And one more time in slow motion. Because life is a continuum, it doesn't sort of suddenly change. You know, when you go to bed at night, you wake up pretty much the same person in the morning. Maybe a little bit older, but pretty much the same, at least recognizable. You don't morph into something different. The thing is, when I snuffed out that candle flame, there was indeed a sudden change. Yes, there's a continuum of cause and effect. At no time was there an event without an effect. At no time that was there an event without a cause. It's a seamless chain of cause and effect. Nevertheless, there's a sudden change. And what the candle flame became is significantly different to what it was while it was alight and burning. Now, of course, the situation is exactly the same with ourselves. Any one of us can die at any moment. And uh, it could be that in a few short days, we'll be pushing up the daisies down at the local cemetery. That will be the effect of who we are. Of course, there'll be many, many other effects as well. But just as with the candle flame, there is no evidence that we become another person or that we're reborn as a rabbit or a fish or... Um, anything like that. All there is, there's just ordinary cause and effect. We are no different to a candle flame. A candle flame is our brother. Now the problem with many modern Buddhist teachers, and I want to make it absolutely clear that I'm not criticizing the teachings of the Buddha 
in this video. Um, I've spent the last 30 years studying the teachings of the Buddha and nowhere does he say anything similar to what this particular monk is saying and what most Buddhist monks say, including the Dalai Lama. So I want to make that absolutely clear that um, all I'm criticizing is the teachings of these Buddhist monks who claim that our minds are completely different to everything else in the universe. So they believe that candle flames behave in a particular way, bricks and rocks and trees, they all behave in the same way, ordinary cause and effect. But when it comes to our consciousness, all of those rules are thrown out the window because the consciousness they claim is completely different to everything else in the universe. They don't offer any uh, reason to believe this. It's a case in philosophy, they call it special pleading. The mind, in this sixth sense, it usually uses your brain, but it doesn't have to use the brain. Once the brain stops and the brain dies, in other words, the mind doesn't need that brain anymore, and it actually can be free of the brain. Okay, next up, this monk claims that everybody uh, in the final moments of their life magically gains clarity. So as the brain is dying and uh, is depleted of oxygen, no matter what kind of uh, illnesses you might have, like Alzheimer's, all of a sudden your mind achieves absolute clarity and perfect memory. So even though you may not have been able to remember anybody in your life, you've forgotten everything in, in your life, uh, all of a sudden, the moment before you die, suddenly you can remember everything. Hmm. I'll let him speak for himself. And what actually happens in the last minutes or two, sometimes more, sometimes less of your life, you get clarity. For people who have such bad Alzheimer's disease, in the last minutes of their life, they will be clear, they will wake up, they will remember everything, because that's the nature of your mind. It uses the brain for most of your life, but it does not have to use the brain. And at that last few moments of life, it separates from the brain. Okay, next up, our monk tries to prove scientifically, because uh, we know uh, how, how brilliant monks are at science, um, prove scientifically that we don't need a brain at all, and that we can um, think perfectly normally and live perfectly normal lives um, completely without a brain. Uh, now, um, there's a disease called hydrocephaly, I believe, um, where the amount of brain tissue is massively reduced and the, um, the space within the skull is largely filled up with cerebrospinal fluid. Um, the amount of brain tissue can be as low as in the order of 5% of the normal brain tissue and the person can remain alive. Uh, of course it's not without its problems. Here's what the monk has to say. The doctor gave him a, a brain scan, a, a CT scan, and it was only 1% cortex was there, everything else was missing. Basically, as Professor Lorber said, he had no brain to speak of. And there's no way that that small amount left could actually compensate for everything which was missing. <clears throat> now, what Lorber, the researcher, actually said was that the patient in question um, actually had, in his rough estimate, between 5 and 15% of the brain mass of a normal brain. 
and that five and fifteen between five and fifteen percent could be even higher because um, it's difficult to tell from brain scans is certainly not virtually nothing it's a signif significant amount of brain tissue um, also in the case of people who only have five percent of uh, the normal brain mass 50% of those are profoundly retarded. So you can imagine if 50% of them are profoundly retarded, the other 50%, um, put it this way, things aren't going to be too rosy. Your mind, that ability to cognize, to form thoughts, to actually exercise will, is independent of your body especially independent of your brain. And at last moments of life, that's what happens. Independent of your body, eh? Try saying that after you haven't had any sleep for three or four days and your body is screaming at you to go to sleep. doesn't really matter how much your mind wants to keep functioning. Your body will cause you to enter unconscious sleep. Okay, I think I've said enough on this score. Um, the message of this video is basically don't believe a word of what these Buddhist teachers are saying. Use your own intelligence. I can recommend studying the teachings of the Buddha uh, you know, try and get the original teachings, or, you know, Eng English translation, of course. Um, but really, you can work things out for yourself.